welcome to the Lipstick League. I'm Natalie Eganoff. I'm Nicole Mahalik. And we have not only another guest, we have two more guests. And I mean, this is so exciting for us. Like, do we, I don't even know if you need an introduction. Do we need an introduction? It's, it's the longs. It's I mean, the longs. Come on. Howdy. What's give up? It up hey. Give it up for Meg and Chris Long joining us from, where are you guys at now? Charlottesville, Charlottesville. Right? Charlottesville. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Joining us from all the way from Charlottesville, Virginia, um, taking a time out of their morning to sit here and chat with the lipstick league. Uh, we're so happy to have you guys. Um, and Nicole and I, you know, when we were putting together our podcast and putting together a list of people, we were just going on and on and on of, you know, our bucket list guests and you two were absolutely on there because, you know, Chris, you in Philadelphia are a legend and Meg, you're a badass because like, we're so obsessed with your, you know, career path and everything that you've done in your life. And we're like, they would just be so perfect to have on and getting you two together is just kind of in amazing for us. It's so. our first podcast together. It is. Yes. I've been trying oh to get God. her on my podcast and she wouldn't come on it like you at wouldn't? all. What? Okay, so <laughs> must, <laughs> must really respect your y'all's podcast. So, I, we got to give a shout out to your brother. Oh yeah. Matt. Oh Matt. So, yeah. So man. We got to take it back. We got to take it back to 2013. And so Matt and I met cuz we went to the same gym. It was called it was called Fusion and now it's called Unite and it sucks now, but alas. <laughs> we always went to the same class and that's kind of where we became friends. And so it was, you know, getting ready for the weekend and we're just like, oh, what are you doing this weekend? He's like, oh, well, actually my sister's getting married. And I was like, oh, that's fun. And he's like, yeah, it should be a good time. And I was like, well, do you like your future brother-in-law? And he's like, yeah, he's cool. He's like, well, do you, he's like, he plays in the NFL. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And, and he was like, do you know Howie Long? And I was like, yeah, of course, he's a legend. He's like, oh, well, it's his son, Chris Long. He plays for the Rams. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. And I'm like, you like them? He's like, they're actually like really awesome. Actually? <laughs> yeah. actually? <laughs> he was like, they're they're actually awesome. And I was like, oh, okay. And like, didn't think anything of it, right? And I was like, have fun at the wedding. Like, that's cool. So then the fast forward, I'll never forget. I was at my old radio station and the news came out that you were coming to the Eagles. And I texted Matt and I was like, oh, well, this is cool. Same guy. Yeah. 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 I was like, huh. You know, I was, you know, cause Matt moved to New York. So he left Philly. And so like, you know, we would stay in touch over text. Oh, we were so excited. He, he came was back. one of our first Dude. calls and we honestly like kind of organically all, all decided to live in the same apartment building yes. and yes. then on the same. Oh, that's floor. so fun. And yeah. Our son Waylon just used to run between the two apartment buildings all season. So yeah, yeah. it was, it was, it, it was, was so fun. And then I was like, wait, so that's cool. Your sister's moving back to Philly. And then literally like everything blew the fuck up and like, yeah. and now like you guys are who you are. And I was like, how weird is this? Like, and it's weird that I specifically remember that random conversation about him going to your wedding. Right. And it was like, and then it just became this thing. And I was like, this is like really, we just actually just went to Elvez for brunch like two weeks ago. And, <laughs> and I was like, and he was telling me about, I mean, I knew you guys lived in the apartment, but he was like, yeah, they got there and then they moved. But he always said it was just like so weird how he came back from New York and you guys came from Boston at the same time. And he was like, a, you know. he was like the resonant, like do it all uncle. I mean, yep. he really yep. was for us. Aww. And that was huge because, you know, it was like, a crazy time it was a crazy time from a career standpoint it was a crazy time for meg you know trying to juggle so many responsibilities with the kids and like even our first son waylon yeah it, it was just a blessing to have matt in the building and yeah. he just came down and saw us recently so um i'm always excited you know like some people dread when their in-laws come in i don't yeah yeah yeah, yeah no uncle matt's a favorite around yeah. here for sure yeah and it's it you know obviously we've been friends for so long and then I was like, hey, so can I throw you a favor? Like, we want your sister and Chris on the podcast. Cause like, and he was like, all right, I'll, I'll ask. <laughs> <laughs> that was a perfect <laughs> impression. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let's make this about you guys. Um, we won't go back too far because, but Meg, I don't know if a lot of people know cause yeah. obviously we have people that listen in Philly but we, it's people that live all over the place, but you're actually from the Philly burbs. You're from Morristown yep. and then you went to the university of Virginia and that's where you two met. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in uh, South Jersey, um, played lacrosse there at Morristown and ended up going to UVA for lacrosse and 
met this guy. He was actually the first guy I met at UVA. We met in the training room, like right before our freshman year. Um, you were like, could you help me with my squats? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was a large, large human. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I did <laughs> I was a lot bigger at that point. Yeah. I was probably 20 pounds heavier. So something to see. Um, so yeah. Then we dated Wait, and uh, so how it was weigh-ins. It was uh we were just in, in the training room, right? I had to weigh in for something for lacrosse. Yes. And I remember like the football guys were like, whoa, ho, like all behind me on the not race. me though. Not me I know, though. I know. He was, You're he a was the nice one, like in the other room. And um <laughs> yeah, it was uh so wait, I so how did the how did it happen? Like, did you talk to him? Did he talk to you? Was there like a wink, finger guns? Like, what was like the interaction? Um, you remember? I think you came up and talked to me. I just came I'm up kidding. and said hi. My yeah. jersey nice. curls, the crunchy ones were like in full effect. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I think that's what got him, you know? Yeah. It was really <laughs> like... hard, hard to resist. <laughs> I'm really sad she left those behind though. So I was like, I yeah. hope we make a resurgence for one for me. Oh, I try, I have you know, too. kids like changed my hair. I'm like, oh. I'm trying here. It's not, yeah. Yeah. In and the was, summer, we might get some uh, some lion's mane going on. Yeah, nice. you just got to go know? to the store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, beach hair, beach yeah, hair. Yeah, when you're in Ocean City, it, it's uh -huh. all, like it's like they it's like the hair knows like I'm back in Jersey. I know? feel <laughs> like we're in the training room again. Yeah, like yes. twinkle in my eye. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. Chris, obviously, this is one of the questions that I love to ask when we get to talk to athletes is obviously your dad is your dad. Yeah. One, did you ever feel the pressure to follow in his footsteps? And two, when did you realize that you were elite? When did you realize like, oh, I'm actually also going to be in the NFL? Yeah, I never felt the pressure to follow in his footsteps because him and my mom kind of reinforced like that I could do whatever I wanted. They yeah. always tell a story when I was like 10 and I wanted to come out for football. There was an internal debate in the bedroom as I was <laughs> sleeping. Um, <laughs> and as there were so many and uh, it came down to, Hey, do we let him play or do we not? Well, we don't want him to play. So what do we do? We let him go out and play because if he goes out and play, he's, they thought I was a wimp and they thought I would come home and like get my nose, but he didn't cry. Wow. And I was a wimp, but, and I wasn't very good, but I really loved it. Yeah. Um, and uh Really, it wasn't until high school, probably, I started getting offers, and I was like, oh, I'm pretty good. Um, I never felt like I had to play, though, because my parents were so cool about, you can do whatever you want to do. Just do yeah. it with pride. And um, I think the pressure kicks in once you do realize, okay, I'm in for it. I'm going to play 10, 11 years in the league if I'm lucky. There's nobody that's there to guarantee you're not going to embarrass yourself. I mean, it's really the scariest thing in the world is, like, getting drafted in the NFL, um, it's an opportunity, but it's also a real challenge. And so probably draft day when you're like, oh shit, I just got drafted fucking second. Yeah. And people are going to be looking at me through a, a, a you know, a, a microscope. But the, the worst part about it is I'm not like any other kid. Everybody's going to be comparing me to my dad. Who's a hall of famer. Right. 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 So, you know, I've always felt the pressure to live up to him. Now, what I do with that pressure is my choice. You know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't beat myself up when I don't because Lord knows you could have a great career and you're not gonna have a gold jacket. That's what my pop said. Right. So I'm at peace with being my dad's kid. And uh, it's actually helped me get where I am today. You know, it turns you into a motivated person. You know, you read the press clippings, you read people saying you're only there because you're dad. Right. So you kind of use that as a motivation, like not the haters, but the people that were like, can he do it? Yes, because I mean, it's stupid. I feel like every pro athlete now, if you ask them, like, do you have doubters? Everybody wants to overplay the doubter hand because it's like the cool thing. Yeah, I've had a great life. I've, uh, I've had a lot of opportunities because of who my dad is as far as like, I've had an opportunity to learn from somebody who knows the trade. I've had an opportunity right. to when I call when I have a tough day at work, I call my dad and he understands right. it. And he's not just like asking me questions. Um, that's all well and good. And obviously the genetics of the bare minimum being able to play in a league, but um, I do think the pressure can suck sometimes and it does make you, it does make you kind of, it hardens you up a little bit to deal yeah. with the criticisms that other people might str struggle with. Because when I got to league, I was used to when I committed to Virginia, oh, it's only because of his dad. When I got a scholarship offer, you know, when I got drafted, et cetera, even when I got a big deal after, you know, a great year, it's always going to be that way. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So you guys were dating in college and Meg, at what point, were you like, oh, like, 
we're going into the NFL. Like, did that ever like freak you out? Because let's talk, I mean, you played lacrosse or through I, college. Yeah. You are I, a badass athlete. Yeah. And how did that, how, how were you thinking during that time through that whole process? Um, might sound very naive, but I really wasn't. I really wasn't thinking about what was next for us um, and where and how. Um, interestingly, when he was at the draft, we were preparing for, I think, round two of the NCAAs. UNC? Was it UNC? Wow. And again, right. UNC, we were in the film room and my coaches paused the film and we turned on live, we turned the draft on live. So we got to see Chris drafted at number uh -huh. two and we were all cheering in the locker room, but then it was like, okay, right back to right back to business, yeah. right back to this. Um, and we got upset and lost, but, um, oh. that's okay. Um, <laughs> but I think that, you know, it wasn't until I think after you got back and like St. Louis was like, a, you know, sinking in and yeah. you went to like, look at apartments and we came, you know, I visited once or twice that we kind of were like, okay, like, this is this is happening and yeah I'm gonna yeah. um go there with you and um you know find a job and it was weird it's like a, it's like anybody who gets a job in the middle of the country somewhere they've never been we were yeah. just like two kids we're like what are we doing yeah. we're playing house and <laughs> yeah you know, i know because like... i mean honestly you were both so it's like so young at the time right and you don't think that you're young then you're like i i know everything in life and mm -hmm. i'm gonna be just fine and then here yeah here you are smack dab in another like city that you don't even know um, what was, what was that transition? Like, I guess for you guys together, like, you know, and you Meg just being there through all yeah. of it kind of, and, it, you know, and you as an athlete yourself, like, do you think that that gave you an advantage and kind of like really understanding, um, the dynamics and, you know, what he would be going through? Um, I would hope that I, you know, we kind of never, I guess, truly like verbalized, but I would hope like I, you know, through the process, gave him the space he needed and, right. you know, didn't create um, a lot of distraction outside of the game. Chris has right. always been from day one, really good at not bringing work home. Uh -huh. So I think that that's always helped us. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, I tried to, I definitely learned how to be a very independent person and okay. I, but in a positive way. Um, right. I, I made some friends on the team, but I kind of found, I kind of used lacrosse to help me. I started coaching out there. Right. Um, and then I, you know, coach at the high school level and, you know, transitioned into like a PE teaching job. Like after I was like in electronic health records, like, yeah, but she did one. I was like, what they won the state that? championship. She's not going to say that, but like, yeah, uh, John I, no, Burrow, I have it on my notes. Yeah. Yes. John, <laughs> yeah she won this, I'll, I'll say it. So it was yeah. fun. It became, you know, I, you start, you start to build your own life out, outside of it. And I think that that really helps us as a couple too that you're not so dependent upon right a person in kind of the middle of nowhere where you have to make friends I mean yeah. I remember you know a couple friends I had would say hey I know somebody somebody's friend who lives out there you guys should connect and blah blah, blah. and we'd I'd literally be emailing these girls like to meet at this bar and like I'll be wearing like a red sweater. I'm like, yeah. this is, I'm blind dating. That's awkward adult to meet stuff. Yeah. Right. It is, it's awkward stuff when you're kind because, of in a brand new place, but. Because we were like, we were on teams, right? And like, I continue to be on a team. So I was lucky. Like, yeah, and I yeah. also, you know, I was cognizant of the fact that, you know, she moved out to St. Louis and she's not on a team for the first time in her life. And now she's got to meet like random friends. I know that's right. not like what she's into, like emailing people and being like, right. let's meet at the bar. Like, yeah. it's a weird, that's a, like, it's a jarring process. Like, I love you, man. Like Miami <laughs> or somewhere desirable for my friends to, to fly and visit me. Yeah. It would have been a lot easier, but to kind of get people out to St. Louis on a regular basis was not. Once they came though, they loved it. Yeah. Yeah, they did. So yeah, talk about the state championship. So did you help, you helped start the lacrosse program at the school, right? No, it was in existence. <laughs> okay. um, and when I started coaching, um, I was coaching with a guy named Peter Task who ended up being the athletic director there. Um, we won the state championship our first year together coaching. And then he took the athletic director job and I took over as head coach. And then we won two after that. Um, amazing. So we kind of started the, you know, the, the rain there at John Burroughs. And then on the side, there was no club opportunities for girls 
out yeah. in St. Louis. And right. I really do. I think at that time and still is lacrosse has so many opportunities at the collegiate level. Cause there's so many programs sprouting yeah. all over. Yeah. So, you know, I started a club program sixth through 12th grade to try to help these girls get some looks at college, whether it was D3 or whatever it was. So we would, you know, travel to the East coast and play in some of the big tournaments. Um, and that was really fulfilling and really fun and felt like I made awesome. a difference in the lacrosse community there a yeah. little bit. So just in that like intermediate, like sixth to eighth grade level that you were working with, with these girls, like, what do you think, I guess, look at, you know, in comparison to boys sports in, in where, like in the town where you were, like, what do you think the barriers were to them getting to like that next level of success? Do you think it was just like investment in, you know, the sport, or do you think it was just like people not really understanding that there were opportunities for women? Um, yeah, I think the idea, the look, the sport of lacrosse itself was just, it's just not very big in the Midwest. Chicago okay. was at that time, Northwestern right. as the university was phenomenal. They're the ones that beat me twice in the national she championship hold on to during that my at time. All. Not at all. Lacrosse <laughs> was around that area, but in within St. Louis, it was still very, very new concept. And I okay. think that, um, that's what made it really fun for girls and just athletes in general. I mean, I started playing lacrosse my sophomore year in high school yeah. and loved it. And so yeah. I think if you're a multi-sport athlete, it's really easy to pick up. And that's okay. what I was just trying to find. And, and she had girls go to college to play, which was really cool. And yeah. Like, you know, yeah. 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 So you were the first champion in the family. So Chris is basically <laughs> by, <laughs> by about a decade. I mean, yeah. Like, so. so basically your whole relationship, he's like, I'm going to win. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we weren't real good in college either. And they were always, you know, cream of the crop and Virginia is not really a football school. I mean, it is, but it's not like Virginia, they care about basketball. There's so yeah. many great Olympic sports. Her sport was amazing. Like the men and women are great. So yeah, there was always like a, Hey Meg, you win a lot. Uh, right. I'd love to win too. <laughs> but wait, to really quick back to, back to your brother, Matt, when Shits Creek was live at, they did like a whole, a whole um, live tour. He volunteered at the Met to go on stage and he won the Shits Creek Q and A. I remember that. <laughs> Just, just, just champions just run in your family. Everybody's just charisma. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. Okay, so you're in St. Louis, and then, Chris, were you just like I see? Like, was it about winning that wanted that decided to go to the Patriots, or was it just you needed to shake it up? You knew it wasn't going to happen in St. Mm -hmm. Louis. Like, how did how did that happen? It was all about winning. I mean, yeah. at the juncture I had arrived at after year eight you know, like had a great run in St. Louis. Um, but within two years in the NFL, you, you know, I went from captain to cut and like, yeah. that's just the way it is in the NFL. If you have yeah. injuries, they don't, they don't, you know, it's a production business and I never blamed them, but like the last, my eighth year, um, we were living in a hotel, nice hotel. I'm not like, again, making this, yeah. some like sob story, but I knew I was getting cut, you know, by halfway through the year. And I knew the team was, was moving and we had made a really special bond with the fans there. Um, you know, like I know I have a really cool bond with the Philly fans, but St. Louis is kind of like, they, they took care of me and they, and they, um, we were bad and I had an individual success and some of my teammates had individual success like James Laronitis or Robert Quinn or Steven Jackson, obviously, but they showed up every Sunday, you know, to one in 15 seasons, two and 14 seasons, you know, the Eagles, the Eagles fans, like they're the best in the world imagine going one and 15. Okay. For a second, you think your head's exploding because the team <laughs> went seven and nine or whatever. Like yeah. we're doing that every year. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate right. those fans. And then, yeah. you know, leaving St. Louis was tough, but it made it easier because the team was leaving too. And it felt like, right. okay, it's sad, but the whole thing's blowing up. I don't want to move to LA. Um, I don't want to play somewhere else like that. I need to seize this opportunity to win. You know, at this point I'm 32, maybe. Um, and my time is short and I had some suitors. It actually came down to Atlanta and New England. Oh, interesting. Okay. Bowl, of course was Atlanta, New England. And I was sitting there at halftime down 28 to 21 <laughs> to three at the time, almost 28 to three in that famous 28 to three comeback. And I'm sitting on the bench and thinking I made the wrong decision, you know, Ooh, like, yeah. and the gravity of like, you'll never win. Like you had some success individually, but your career is a waste. 
Um, that's how I felt. And um, so that's why that that second half of that game really – if we lose that game in the second half, and Meg would tell you, I probably would have just said, fuck this shit, and I'm right. out. Right. Because right, I had had enough oh, of football. I was sitting there at halftime in the stands like, oh, no, this is <laughs> – Yeah. Because she knew be, I, the rest of my life, I'd probably yeah. be a very different person. This is going to be right. a grudge he holds for a really – or like, it, a, a, like a, not a grudge, a just – like a chip a on your shoulder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Things stick. It's, things stick. it's yeah. hard to get over things, man. It's hard oh, to get yeah. over, you know, the feelings that you harbor from your career. And I had a wonderful career where I was very lucky, especially towards the back end. Um, saw most of what you'd want to see, but I still have regrets and there's still feelings I have a hard time getting over about my career. Um, and a lot of them are circumstantial and just like bad luck. But I can only imagine if you don't win that Super Bowl or then subsequently end up in Philly, like, it's a God. It was like literally God sent for me. And I can only imagine being on the other end of that being down up 28, three and losing that Super Bowl. Yeah. Let me go back to when you knew you were getting cut. Is that, does that weigh on you? Or are you like, this is a good thing. Cause I'm going to get another opportunity. Or are you like, fuck these guys. I gave them my life. I no. can't believe they're doing this. It definitely wasn't the last thing, you know, like as an athlete, you're hardwired to always at the very least think you can compete with the best and right, like right. think you are i've never been one that's like hardwired to think i'm the best because like that's like god level arrogance that some of the best athletes in the world have i i don't have that um right. but i'll compete with the best and i'll scrap with the best and it was hard for me because my eighth year i had lost my job i broke my tibia a couple games right. back after i had an ankle surgery the year before and i was out there just getting my feet back under me I had played hurt the last year and looked awful. You know, like teams tell you, see what yeah. you can do out there. And then they go and cut you because you look like shit and your, your, your market values down. That's what was happening to me. And I lost my job and it was hard. My best friend, William Hayes, one of my best friends in the world, was the guy who took my job because I was gimping around. Yeah. And that didn't affect our relationship, but it was hard because you've been watching, you've been a hallmark, you've been like a cornerstone for years and you're watching yeah. other people run out through the tunnel. You're getting paid a lot of money. You're hurt. It's an embarrassing feeling. It's just right. like, you just feel like you're just the biggest bummer for everybody else, including your teammates. And it was almost like a release when it was like, I could not wait for the year to end so I could just get the fuck out of there. And it wasn't because I didn't like it there. Yeah. I wished it had worked out. Um, and I loved my teammates, but I knew that I was a burden at this point. And I wanted to hurry up and get my next opportunity. Yeah. So you go to, you go to Boston and May, what was that like for you in regards to your whole life? You set up this whole life in St. Louis and now right. all of a sudden you just got to pick up and go. Did you at this point know that it was just part of the deal? Like, this is what well, I signed up for. It's a short amount of time. Like, or were you like, ugh, like this kind of stinks. Well, and also I was wondering, did you guys have children yet at this point? So you right, have Right around when Chris was was released from the Rams is when Waylon was born. So that yeah. was like so our first and our oldest. Okay, yeah. what, and that was what like 20... 2016. 2016. 2016. Okay. Born, yep. So a, yeah. and it was on. She was pregnant in the um in the hotel, and we were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we like we like packed up. We were yeah we were ready. But, yeah. Um, no, it wasn't. I it was eight long years there. And, yeah. Okay. You know, Chris had a great career there, super loyal. So, you know, like he said, we loved St. Louis, but it yeah. just felt like it was time to go. Yeah. Um, and I didn't think New England was going to be a long stop. Yeah. Um, but I also had a tiny baby. And so right. that yeah. was my time anyway. So um, I definitely wasn't looking around like, oh, what am I going to do in Foxborough where it's like a Dunkin' Donuts and, yeah. and Gillette Stadium. It's cold. I, it's cold. And the sun so goes cold. down early. I mean, I really just, me and Waylon, we hung out. It was, a, lot, it was a, a it was a peaceful time it though. Really like was. you look back, like not for, for me as much. And I know you had to grind at home with Waylon, but like, you know, we'll always, I think, look back at that time, even though Foxborough wasn't like a happening place to live, or maybe it wasn't the perfect, you know, situation, but it was just us in a yeah. quiet little apartment no, no and distraction. you know, yeah, like was, we got to spend nice. a lot of quality time with that little, yeah. 
that little nugget. And yeah. so and yeah. I knew why he was there was to was to literally the big one. And I right. it was total. So that's all you hope for. You just you know as you keep going and going. It was and a business trip now, to try to get a ring. It was super. <laughs> yeah different and awesome to go to games and just like win 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 compared mm -hmm. yeah. to st louis i mean that right. felt that was awesome to yeah go to that um and then yeah like you said when you go to the super bowl you're like oh my gosh this is actually happening for him yeah. so it was and then so then you win okay so you're let's talk about that game really quick the the 28-3 so you're on the 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 patriots atlanta game so you're on defense so mm -hmm. You know, my dad always says, which shout out to St. Louis, because my dad's a crazy St. Louis Cardinal fan because oh, wow. okay. my, my pop-up's name was Stanley. So the, Stan Musial. Stan Musial. So, so yeah. there's like a small little part of me that- Stan the man. Yeah. So my dad's like crazy St. Louis. Um, yeah. But the, so you're, you're in that moment. And my dad always says, um, offense sells tickets, but defense wins games. He yeah. coached basketball. Like my dad's the guy that watches ESPN classic and yells at the TV. <laughs> like dad, from 1988, like you already know the outcome. Yeah. Um, so in that Super Bowl game, you're it's at halftime and you know, basically like the defense is the reason that won that game. Right. What, what is that explain to somebody who's never played football before, even on a team who's listening, what is it like mentally and then physically to make that happen? Well, listen, it was one of those things where I'll say that we, we, we stepped up big in the second half um, defensively because I think we allowed a touchdown and that was it. But the first half, we couldn't stop anything. So, right. you know, like and the offense sucked, too. And that includes like the goat. And he would tell you yeah. it was the worst half. Like it was like it was purgatory. It was just like everything that could go wrong was going wrong and um we couldn't get out of it and that half was a blessing like the fact that we were allowed to go back into the locker room and just take a break from that ass kicking because yeah. and a lot of people think there's some fiery speech or that you know like it's in the movie and bill's giving a big speech and tom's giving a big speech and that he rips off his sleeves yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bill walks in the locker room. Exactly. All right, guys, you know, we're going to do it. GIF or GIF, however you prefer it, of him walking out of the lion's tunnel, uh, yeah. not shaking anybody's hand. Like, yeah. he literally, when shit hits the fan, I feel like Bill knows well enough to project composure. Interesting. And I think some coaches, like, and as much as Bill Belichick might yell and as much he might have wanted to yell at that juncture, what good is that going to do at that point? Right. Right. What we need to do is make plays and do the little things. And I think resetting allowed us to take a break. You know, you had some people like, we're going to win this game. And I always tell the story, I think it was Deron Harmon, God bless him, was like, we're going to win this game. And I was sitting there in my chair like, how about we just right. gonna stop, dude, <laughs> or score a point? Um, and here was the problem. And this is very interesting. I tell people this all the time. You have the backdrop of like our experience in St. Louis, the type of football we watched and participated in. When you get to New England, I don't care if I was there for a year. I have not retrained my my positive thinking, you know, right. like, yeah. so I'm in the locker room thinking we lost, dude. And there's a difference. Like, that's not giving up. Giving up is not playing hard. I played my ass off in the second half, but you can play your ass off case in point eight years in St. Louis and have no expectation of winning. That's how a lot of guys took the field in the second half. Like, let's finish. Mm -hmm. Like, let's let's give it a shot. And then as it built and as the running back for Atlanta yeah, mi missed a blitz protection, Dante Hightower runs in untouched and just blows up Matt Ryan. The ball hits the deck in plus territory and we're rolling. And like, that's the moment where I think people looked around and said, oh, we can win this game. Right. And then we get to overtime and, and we win the toss and defense. We just took our helmets off and sat there because we knew we're not going back out there. Right. He was just going to go out there and do his thing. And sure. then, yeah. And that, and that was going to be it. What, so, you know, in that play, in that moment, do you think, and cause Nicole and I touch on this all the time, especially when it comes to like team dynamics, cause we're, we're fascinated with, you know, clearly like the X's and O's is such an important part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but also like, you know, do you think that there was, like you said, there's that general sense where you're like, okay, we can all win this game. And then it's everybody kind of just like transitions to like another level of mindset where yeah. do you think it's like, do you almost have like a tunnel vision in that moment where you just, where you see the field and you see the ball differently? Like, well, that's how it, I imagine it. Yeah, I've never yeah. played football, but I feel like once you reach that level where you're like, I can do this and, and you mm -hmm. know, things are starting to happen. It, I feel like, and you know, what's funny. And I I'm rambling now. 
in I was in the locker room. You've been talking guys. for seven seconds, dude. Yeah. You can. Yeah. No. <laughs> I've been. Um, I was in the locker room with you guys in you know the fifty-two, the Super Bowl fifty-two season. Um, and I remember you said sometimes I think yeah, it was definitely you. You said sometimes the ball just bounces your way. He's like, and sometimes you can just see the ball, see things going your way. Yeah. So was that? I guess was the first instance of you kind of seeing that and realizing like, damn, we can win the Super Bowl right now. And do I do think, think so. I do yeah. think so. And I think belief is something that's so like fans can think about belief and in such a cliche sense. I think that like teams catch the bug and that you can't just decide like okay now we're gonna believe you know like yeah. I, I don't think like you can yell belief into your teammates which is why right I think execution breeds belief and I think like each player focusing in and I don't give a shit if you think you can win the game or if you think you're any good or not like how do you compartmentalize the situation we're in to give maximum effort and to execute and if everybody starts executing and doing simple shit, then all of a sudden we all believe. And it's like feeding a fire. It's literally like, you know, feeding a fire, feeding a fire. And then before you know it, the thing is like burning the hairs off your arm and your eyebrows, like, cause you right. need to get back. Like that's, that's kind of what it turned into. And um, when we lit that thing up, it was just like Atlanta, you could feel it. They teams go into a shell. Yeah. Because they're like, they go from the offensive to the defensive, and that's the mindset change. And play callers can do that too. And I think right. Kyle Shanahan tried to stay on the attack in that game. But like the last drive, they're throwing the ball. They're in field goal range. Right. They have a couple of negative plays. They're out of field goal range. And that allowed us to drive the ball down, score a touchdown, go for two, and force overtime. Yeah. Which was one of the plays that I've never been more – scared of my scared life. yes so, yes i so thought you're sitting got caught off sides on that one third down and it was a, actually a hold on you that took them out of yes the but and i was up there like no <laughs> not just jump off sides. and ruin the super bowl oh, i was like <laughs> what was going on they would have gotten a would you have divorced me? <laughs> <laughs> so wait, yeah, Meg, what was going through your mind as all this is going down on the field? I mean, you had been through every single moment in St. Yeah. Louis. And now you're like, we're it all was, the It was just in the stands like, okay, here they go. Here they right. go to do it. And then, you know, anytime Tom Brady's your quarterback and things are going well, you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to work out. <laughs> yeah, so. Except when they play the Eagles. Yeah. Because, right. because we scored 60 points. Right. Right. Yeah. But as an Eagle, but then turning as an Eagles fan in the stands and you know what Tom did last year to turn around, you're like, please, like, please keep it going. Like Tom, yeah. do not. Well, wait, I it. always talk about, and obviously people, we've talked about the, the Eagle Super Bowl in, in ad nauseum, but we'll talk a little bit about it. But I, we led me into this is that there's that there's, we had a Super Bowl party and it's two minutes left and people at my party are celebrating and Tom, and they flash to Howie and Howie's face is like, he looks uh -huh. like he's gonna throw up and I was like that's how all you asshole you see how how he's he like Tom Brady has two minutes left yeah that yeah. does like shut up sit uh -huh. down uh -huh. you really need to go get a beer now with two minutes I was like you people clearly are not fans oh I mean, yeah but I always like when they flash that camera and how he looks like he's gonna throw up like that's the feeling like when you have two minutes left and Tom Brady has the ball yeah you should be yeah. puking, not celebrating <laughs> and, like, no exactly you're exactly right <laughs> And, um, you know, I think we lulled them into a false sense of security because we made a play the possession before. Yeah. Uh -huh. We hadn't made a play in like, you know, since the second quarter. And, yeah. um, you know, people always say like, oh, y'all beat Tom Brady. I'm like, I didn't beat Tom Brady. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Nick Foles beat Tom Brady, which is a huge, huge accomplishment because Tom, and this is the thing about rings and counting people's rings and Tom has plenty. Tom didn't lose that Super Bowl. You know, their defense yeah. lost that Super Bowl, and they'd right. tell you that. I mean, Tom threw for 500-plus yards. Yes. <laughs> it so happened that Nick just went off. Yeah. The best game of his life just happened to be the Super Bowl against Tom Brady. Like, well, and that's, What a beauty. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what, like, no, that's awesome. Yeah. Like, how we were saying, you know, like, the energy and just, you know, the way that things kind of come together. And now, can you compare – the two teams like can you yeah. compare what it was like you know the energy level with the patriots and then the energy level with the eagles like do you think that it was different um 
in any sort of way because you have, you know, the Patriots were a winning organization, right? And then you have the Eagles, you know, yeah. and then you have the city of Philadelphia who are all like on their hands and knees and face planet, like, please, dear God, just Dang. let this happen. You know, like, <laughs> could you, do you know, like, was that also like a factor in what, what like, what? Yeah, going I always say I make no bones about it. My favorite Super Bowl out of the two, like, and this, there's no bad Super Bowl. It's like, oh, no, it's yeah. Super Bowl over yeah. LeBron and Michael. It's like, we right. turned into a society <laughs> that if you put anybody number two, you hate them or you're right. a hater. Yeah. I, like, come on. We, we were a part of a thing in Philly that, this is the least humble thing I'll ever say. We're gods there. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I am not an arrogant person. I'm lucky to have the, that status in Philly. There were 53 of us, but we're, we're, we're gods there, dude. Yeah. yeah. And so that's a different thing. How we arrived at that championship, right. all the bumps in the road from losing a franchise quarterback to all the injuries to, you know, the, the ride, like, to the fans it was just different now new england was amazing yeah. okay yeah new england is a first class organization right okay i respect the hell out of bill i had some of the best teammates i've ever had in new england like you know philly fans are like oh chris and lane are tight like chris and fletcher tight bow and chris i have a guy like that i have four or five six seven guys like that in new england too yeah. Um, from not Rob Ninkovich, who Meg mm -hmm. knows FaceTimes at almost midnight, like randomly, <laughs> um, to Devin McCourty, to Matthew Slater, who just yeah. joined our board for Water yeah. Boys and for the Chris Long Foundation, uh, as well as Matthew O'Malley. So we got two mats on there. Yeah, yeah. mats on the board. Yeah, he um, let us know at brunch. Very yeah. <laughs> so, he pick told up. you. Yeah. Pick up. yeah. So, so here is the problem with that as a sidebar. I ate like four gummies. And then Matt like was at the house and I forgot I had to pitch him being on the board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the most awkward thing was Meg was sitting on the couch and I had to give my big spiel. How awkward was my spiel? It wasn't awkward. Really? Matt was in from the beginning. Yeah. So I didn't have to right. give him the spiel. Yeah. He, he was, he was like, playing he was, a little hard to get though, but then, you know. He was doing the thing like, so when are we going to have this conversation? Like as if, yeah, I, think I was like, was, oh, so you want to come, you want to be courted here. Okay, I'm gonna give right. you the whole pamphlet and I'm yeah, stunned right. as fuck. <laughs> very cute at brunch. She was like, Well, looks like I'm officially on the <laughs> foundation board. I was like, oh my God. So I have so many questions about the about the foundation. Yeah. So let's talk about really quick. So you win the Super Bowl in in New England and then was the was the Eagles like a thought? Like, how did that all happen? And and Meg, yeah. obviously, you left. You know, Philly. I call South Jersey Philly because it is. Let's be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Was that part of it that you were going to be close to your family again? You have Waylon, or was it just? Uh, that was part of it. I mean, it was part of it. She us, didn't push it, me there, but that was part no. Of it. Yeah, I mean, it it would have been very cool. You know, in my head, I'm like, man, I hope he, you know, I hope he picks up. But I also. I would have gone to Seattle. I would have gone anywhere. For but I didn't want to feel, take her to Seattle. For him to be happy and successful and doesn't matter. But the fact that it was Philly was was awesome. I mean, and then you have, and then it's that kind of season with family and friends around. It's just so are, it's are, all crazy how it went down. Are all your, fa is all of your family and friends, are they all Eagles fans? Yeah. Oh, oh like, yeah. I mean, my, yeah, I mean. My brother-in-law is a Chiefs fan. Yeah, my brother-in-law is a Chiefs oh, fan. Does he go to that but bar? But Kyle, South my brother just signed there, so it's. it's oh, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, that's. Does he go to that bar in South Philly? What What is the name of it? He li they live in Baltimore right now. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Say, but um, my parents are still bar. in Jersey and my my brother and obviously Matt. And yeah. so um, tons of high school friends still around, so it was it was really it's just cool. it's just like the opposite of moving to a new city where you're like when you're at work you're worried about like is your 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 spouse like bored yeah you know, it's just, yeah it sucks like yeah right. just, I, I don't have to plan her day for her like she, she she has plenty going on but like also at the same time i'm just like i hope she's happy here that's like that's a big deal because when you drag your family somewhere there's a lot of the reason i didn't keep playing like there were teams after philly that were like yo hey come on down and yeah. it was like gonna be a couple thousand mile move right. and i just with a young family philly was amazing that way yeah. you know like we'd never lived in a city okay yeah. i call like when we live in charlottesville downtown i used to call it we live in the city in charlottesville and meg would laugh at me because it's so small but like yeah. We never lived in a city. I loved living in the city. I loved the fact that Meg's parents were there. I loved the fact that, you know, Matt right. was there. Yeah. And then also, like, the way I picked it from a football perspective was um, 
it was just about scheme. We were getting ready for the New England uh, Atlanta game. And I remember the moment I was sitting in the hotel alone in a ballroom and I was watching uh, Atlanta and Philly because they were on our cut up because yeah. they had played each other earlier in the year. And I remember watching BG and Fletch and those guys and Vinny and the speed that guys were playing, like the scheme, because in New England, the scheme was less attacking for me. And I was like kind of out of position and that kind of wore on me. Um, just mentally and physically and so Philly was an opportunity to go back to doing what I was doing in St. Louis yeah right and you know what after the the situation I was just in in New England which was awesome it was a huge change of pace and it was fun it was like okay if I'm going to finish my career I'm going to finish it on my terms have some fun play I got a ring now I'm playing with house money we were supposed to be like terrible yeah yeah so <laughs> you know <laughs> That's how the flagel tattoo ended up happening. Do you know about the flagel tattoo? No. no. I get to see Flage's face. Okay, he's a coach. Time. He's a, oh, a flagel cake. tattoo. I, I can't show it. I got to okay. get in shape before I show it. I think we're going to show it on my podcast. I haven't okay. revealed it in two okay. plus years, but it's a portrait of one of the coaches for the Eagles. I lost the bet. When I was in Philly, the first couple of days, I had this linebackers coach who was with me in St. Louis. So I knew him uh -huh. yeah. and we were in an OTA practice in the summer and I was being a grumpy old man. And I was saying, I was muttering under my breath that we fucking suck. We're not going to win any games. Cause look at us, <laughs> like, look at us. We can't even get lined up. Positive. Well, you know, you need that on a team. And yeah. um, <laughs> somebody has and, to keep it real. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Flage is walking by and he's like, what'd you say, Chris? And I was like, you heard me, Flage. We fucking suck. <laughs> and he's like, Oh yeah, you sure about that? I was like, uh, I was like, Yeah, Flage. If we win, if we win the Super Bowl, I'll get a tattoo of your face on my body. Stop. And, he, and he called Stop a couple it. guys over, and he goes, All right, I'm gonna hold you to that. And I was like, I don't give it. We're not gonna win the Super right. Bowl. <laughs> um, Wait, lo and can behold, you tell he us reminded, where it is. Uh -huh. where, where is it? Where is it? It's Re like right on his rib cage. It like really, it just. <laughs> so then, so then, <laughs> so then in 2018, we're at a joint practice in camp and, um, and you guys could Google Ken Flagel, handsome old man, not a lot of hair. Uh, and uh, she, he walks up to Meg and they've met in St. Louis, but they don't talk often. And what did no. he say to you? Or what did you say to him? He said something like, hey, Meg, I'm coach, blah, blah, blah. I was like, you I, probably know, know. I know exactly who you are. I see you all She time. said, I wake up next to you every morning. <laughs> <laughs> you haunt me in my dreams. Yes, yes. But no, we didn't think we were going to win. That was right. it. Like, like yeah. I would have oh never God. said stuff like, and it's okay. Like, it's okay to not think you're on like a yeah. contending team. You know, yeah. there's 32 teams. Four of them are really, truly contenders. You don't know who they're going to be but yeah i didn't think we fell in that category so well, what it, part of that season did you feel like oh like because my theory is and i listened to your podcast with with um malcolm jenkins which was so good and i and like obviously we i could talk to you for three hours because i want to talk about the foundation i and one of the, the charlotte like, yeah we want to talk about your activism but the thing that you talked about with malcolm my theory and you talked a little bit about it is that team had veterans like you and Malcolm and Tori Smith who have won Super Bowls before, had been in the league a long time. Right. So like you knew what that was. And then there was a lot of those younger guys. Do you feel like that matters that like you helped, you obviously have the coaches, but I, that, that leadership and just being good humans, right? Yeah. Do you think that that, cause to me, obviously like Natalie referenced like the X's and O's matter and the talent, but I don't know. I just feel like a lot of it is just energy and like the type of people you have. And like the yeah. interpersonal dynamics. I, yeah. did, I, I think you guys are right. You know, I, I, it's complicated because you could have the best leaders in the world and suck because you're not good. Yeah. Um, competence unlocks leadership on a team. And so in St. Louis, me and James Laronitis, you know, all this leadership that people love me for later in my career, like I'm this big, like, you know, whisperer. I come in a locker room and I'm like, this is how you win. I don't know how to win. You're the okay. championship whisperer. Yeah, right. oh, you yeah, know, like same thing with yeah. LeGarrette, LeGarrette Blunt, you know, like winning two in a row. Like people yeah. are like, what's the secret? Guys start gravitating to you and you're like, sometimes you're like, I've been saying the same shit for 10, 11 years. There's no guarantee that it's going to punch right. your ticket. You right. know, you have to be, there's great leaders on, good, on bad teams too. What it was, was the perfect storm of 
a really kick-ass football team with a soul. Like we had, yeah. we had like guts, you yeah. know, like we just had some shit to us. And it started, I don't want to say it started with veteran leadership, but you know, we had young guys who were willing to be led and we right. had guys that were willing to play roles and we had guys that were willing to play hard and we loved each other. And I think that's one of the biggest things when you love each other as a team, that's the biggest accountability there is. And, um, and the relationships from that run, you know, it helps that you're winning Yeah. But yeah. rides on the bus, the hotel the night before, you know, sitting up till midnight, just Doug Peterson after uh, meetings being like, every time let's go get some ice cream the race to the briars like dude sitting around we i gotta be up at 7 30 in the morning i'm sitting there in the lunchroom uh in the hotel ballroom with brandon brooks jason kelsey uh kamu you know a whole host of guys and we're up there they're kicking us out at like midnight yeah. i gotta get some sleep because we just enjoy being around each other right yeah and um that's enhanced by winning but we had the bones of a team that that could kind of handle anything that's thrown us because we lost we lost carson yeah. Um, we lost early. We got our ass kicked by Kansas city a little bit. Like we yeah. made it close at the end. Yeah. And you got to remember when Nick came in, it wasn't sunshine and, and rainbows right yeah. away. Like mm -hmm. we damn near tricked a game off to New York because we were focused on the offense. We gave up 29 points to the giants. Yeah. Okay. And then we scored like four points against the Raiders in yeah. a zero degree, uh, yeah. Christmas game, Christmas, yeah. damn near lost to the Falcons. Mm -hmm. Then we rolled. You yeah. know, there was so much, you talk about Nick that year. If Nick had gotten hurt, if Carson got hurt in the playoffs, we don't win the Super Bowl. Yeah. Because there was a long adjustment period. Yeah. That where we had to re kind of grow as a team and we had to, we had the guys that we could do that. Yeah. So Meg, you're obviously from here. This is happening. At what point were you like, oh my God, like we actually might go to the Super Bowl. And like my husband's gonna be the guy that like Philadelphia yeah. is gonna have like tatted on their and body. Then, okay. <laughs> yes, and then that was my next question because then like then you became this superstar not only in Philly but then nationally people became obsessed with you. You were on Ellen, right? Like it was massive. Ellen, so like right. that all happened in that year. What was that like? Did you realize that was happening? Like no, I don't think so. I think it was just like it was just fun to be a part of. And yeah. like it did, it just felt like a long ride of just um, really great things happening for Philly for yeah. individually. Um, and I mean, yeah, you're, you're shocked because you were just in new England and you like never would have thought one, you'd like your husband could win a super bowl. And then now you're like back, he's back there on yeah. a different team. And you're like, this is, it's going to happen again. It was, it, it was crazy to witness, but I would say when I, when I was in the moment, I was just so, I was just so happy for him and happy right. for the city of Philly. I felt like the city of Philly embraced him. Yes. Um, unbelievably. And it, you know, growing up as a Philly fan, I mean, they're tough. They're really yeah. tough. So I was, I was nervous when, he took, he, he was going to Philly just because I just feel like the media and papers and everything, they're brutal. So, yeah. um, the fact that it was going this direction was, was you know, a, it was, was nice. So, you know, it was nice. So imagine that I was in St. Louis making the most money on the team, you know, kind of one of the best, best players on the team, like maybe the best player on the, that's a lot more pressure. And so I think getting to Philly right. at that stage of my career, where I was still a guy who was going to help you on the field, like, you know, I was your, your fourth rusher on third. I was your rusher on third down, yeah, right. but I wasn't like a franchise player. So there wasn't the pressure on me individually. It was like, right. I signed yeah. for a million dollars, which is a lot of money, but in a football sense, it wasn't a lot of money. Um, right. I never felt the pressure in Philly. Mm -hmm. And, and I also got out at the right time, which was key. Right. Mm -hmm. So here's <laughs> my question. Is Philly too hard? I believe that it's true. And coming from somebody who played in Philly, who people are obsessed with in Philly, by the way, because there's people that have been, I mean, Ryan Howard won the, the World Series, World Series and like people in Philly hate they him. They booed on the next they, year. You know what I mean? Like Philly, yeah. so my theory is Philly is way too tough on athletes. And I'm curious how you feel about playing in New England, playing in St. Louis. 
is do you think that that's a real thing that like fans the media it's just too much because i think it ruins players i think the pressure is too intense especially with social media between sports radio oh. and the papers and social media that players can't handle it and it i think mental so this is a nuanced thing but i think um st louis perfect because not perfect but we were terrible it's the perfect place to be terrible nobody <laughs> it's all media driven. So like the right. media, there's nobody at your locker on Monday after a loss, so like three people, you know, the same guys right. in St. Louis. The reason they respected you is if you worked hard and you took, you took losses like a, like, like a professional and baseball was successful and baseball took the pressure right. off too. Right. 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 New England, you know, the media is not as on it as Philly, but it's still a big deal. So it was a nice primer. Um, yeah. And then Philly is, the media is intense, okay? And I got some great friends in the media in Philly because I've always tried to respect, um, you know, the job that beat writers have to do for a living, the people yeah. that are at my locker, yeah, you know, every day have to do for a living. So I respect that and I appreciate that and I hope that comes through. But the media is fucking tough. Yeah. yeah. And I think the media can also rile up fan bases and Philly is a passionate fan base. Um, Philly is my favorite fan base. When people ask me why I root for the Eagles or why I have some allegiance to Philly, organization's cool. It's the fans. It's the city. Right. You know, like, you know, it's the reason that I'm able to, at this juncture with my job that I have now, I'm breaking down football, feel like I can talk honestly about the organization because I don't need anything from the organization. I need something from the fans. I love the fans. I want to be, I want to be, I want to be a part of Philly forever yeah um fans like like for the carson thing for instance i don't want to go down this road too much but all it takes a couple articles and it's a it's a fire i mean yeah. it's just a fire and then you know like somebody like carson who might not deal with the media well because of where he's from yeah or you know what he's been exposed to or hadn't been exposed to just says eventually he's like i'm going in my shell yeah yeah and then yeah. it's it just compounds and so I think the media, if anything, can stoke the flames. But as far as Philly fans being tough, I love that. Like, I yearn for that. You know, I yearn for people to care about – I yearn for a packed stadium, you know, and, like, anybody who came to Philly who maybe hadn't had an experience like that before, yeah. that's pretty much everybody. Yeah. You can't – you got to take the, the bad with the good. The right. bad is that when you lose and you suck, people are going to let you hear about it. But the good is that – it's the most electric place in the NFL to play football. Right. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I'm, you know, born and raised, I've never lived outside the city of Philadelphia. So I'm always intrigued to hear how it is when you come in, you know, to this sort of space and as somebody who, you know, I'm like a, you know, I do sports radio, but I'm a radio personality. I enjoy talking about the teams in like an entertaining way, but as a part of it, I, you know, historically have agreed that it's kind of like, there can be a balance, right? When it comes to the approach on how you're going to talk about the teams, because yeah. growing up here my entire life, perpetually, it's just been this, like, we have to, you know, rain, you know, brimstone and fire on these teams. When I'm like, I like growing up, I just remember being like, I don't know if that's the most effective way you know, <laughs> to kind of like, to kind of like light a fire under people's ass or like try and motivate people. And it's, and it's interesting. And I'm glad that you're saying that because I think that there's like a new generation here now that's that's trying to change it. You know, me, Nicole, you know, people like Yeah, that. you guys. There's, hey, well, well, there's, no, there's no Santa Claus incident anymore. Well, Everybody no, Santa you know, Claus incident. It's, it's funny that you say that. And I do think that that's why it's it's just so fascinating to me and i and i know nothing else right like yeah. like i'm like that's the way that it is but here like the rest of the world is like no it's not actually like that so it's every like, fan base has a personality right, every yeah. city right. has a personality and i think like every you you brought it up with um organizations everybody has it's like people you know right. it's and so there's no you know i could have my favorite there's no best yeah. way to do it um you know somebody like carson might be happier in indy yeah because yeah, that's I just more so. his speed yes. And, you know, we, a lot of fans dehumanize players a lot and I'm not on a soapbox because we get paid a lot of money and I've never complained about getting arrow shot at me or I'm, I was ready for that, but I'm, I'm, no, we I'm a little bit more. I talk about this all the time that yeah. it's beyond, it's beyond anything that's like reasonable, rational, 
decent as just on like a human decency level you know yeah. it, it could just be so it's it's too much People and i'll admit it's better. hard to separate somebody's art from the personal because like if i see a musician that i think their music is trash right. like when i meet them the first thing i'm thinking about is their music right yes but, yeah. but that's oh, not that's who they are that's not right. who they are yeah. although music yeah. and an art is more personal to you right like it's not who i what i how i was as a football player it's influenced by who I am, but it's not who I am. And, you know, I think it's unfair that certain guys have to never live things down or that guys like when you meet a guy that, that, you know, God rest his soul, uh, Bill Buckner in Boston yeah. 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 is the most famous one, the rest of his life. And he passed away recently. He was an amazing baseball player, but only remembered for that. Yeah. And he walks into a room everybody thinks about that error yeah yeah and that's human nature and that's the unfortunate thing and i don't know what the fix is but what you can do is try to be decent to each other and yeah. i think like just remember that you can dog somebody for poor play but when you start to make it personal like off the field personal you yeah. suck and, and like people will do that at times and you know every nfl fan base has an ugly side and like there's people that take shit too seriously. Like the yeah. other day, Gio, shout out to Gio, um, Giovanni, who's got a great podcast, my yes. little buddy. Yeah. Some people online were really like mad at him, like really mad at him because he had a Carson Wentz jersey on. Do you remember when you were a kid and you had a fucking favorite player? Mm -hmm. Like the kid's a kid, not yeah. to mention all he's dealing with. And he has yeah. a pretty cool podcast and he's an awesome social media presence, but he just locked his replies because people don't know when to stop. And yeah. I'm not saying everybody, and I'm not saying it's just, I'm saying like fan bases in general, football fans can be really toxic, yeah. a minority of them. And I think we just have to think about the people um, and being decent to each other. It sounds lame and corny, no. but it's like simple. Yeah. yeah. But, it, and it's just, again, I feel like, you know, I don't want to, we don't want to keep you for much longer because we do have to talk about the organization and all the incredible work that you guys are doing. Um, but it is, it's just about like being better to each other and hopefully now that we've gone through what we've gone through in the last four plus years, it's like we're coming out on this other side now. And I think that, you know, using a voice like yours, Chris, with your podcast and, you know, me and Nicole sitting here trying to advocate, it's just like, it's, it's the voices that are sending the messaging have to, you know, we have to call for it. Right. And yeah. it's like, yeah. And it's, it's not even like, it's not like you're asking or we're asking for, you know, people to like empty their pockets or do anything. It's just like, think about before you send that tweet or think about before you want to just be cruel because you're yeah. like miserable in your own life. I feel like these are right. simple things that are going to make a difference. But when I've been mean to people, yeah. I was miserable. Like I had exactly. something that I was going on. And so, yes. you know, like, and I've been an asshole online. I've also cussed people out. Like oh, I'm a, yeah. I'm a rattlesnake a little yeah. bit, like, but I also am not a bully. I try not to be a bully. I mean, right. I try not to be a bully and I just feel like sometimes fans don't even realize it, which is, it's going to sound stupid to say, but like collectively people can bully a player. Yeah. Right? And it, I just, I don't feel bad for millionaire athletes, but I also, I also think that like, we just forget about the people. That's yeah, all. Cause right. every player I know has a life at home. They have children, yeah. they have, they have, you know, wives, they have parents who are watching and they don't want to fuck up. Right. Well, they're not trying to fuck up. If a guy's bad at a sport, he's not trying to be bad. Yes. And also yes. it's not like being bad at like something basic that everybody's doing. You're on the field with the best in the world. Yeah. In the world. In the galaxy. There's yes. no other yes. football Seriously. out there. <laughs> Seriously. Yes. Yes. I say that all the time. Right. As far so, as we know, Meg makes a good point. That's it, that's true. Who knows what's happening in Mars? You know, I'm I'm, I'm hyped for the um the Mars football team. Like I'm ready to go. Yeah. Like oh, yeah, up there. Let's do so, it. Okay, so let's yes. be serious for a second because you have are quite an ally, activist, very outspoken. When did that obviously the Chris Long Foundation and now you're doing this whole thing with with water girls, but let's just talk about you being a white dude and when did you realize that like you wanted to use your voice to start to help educate people because it's rare and you are one of the 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 lead athletes yeah. in all of sports yeah you and my other dream podcast guest jj reddick oh jj's <laughs> good dude we're gonna get him on eventually um but 
I just respect that so much. And you've, and you've done it for so long. I mean, obviously in Philly, it started, you had the Chris Long Foundation, you ran, you did the, you won the Walter Payton award, which like, oh my God, congratulations. And just everything that you've been doing, like, was that, were you, a was that something that you had as you were a little kid? Did it become when you became in the NFL? Like talk a little bit about how you wanted to become such a voice. I never really wanted to be a voice, honestly. It was like, it just kind of happened because I can't keep my mouth shut, mostly. <laughs> That's like literally how it happens. Yeah. Um, and well, it wait, turns into what are your signs? Oh, when yeah. Are they? I was wondering Aries. what their signs are. Both were. Aries. Oh, my God. Wait, okay. when are your oh. birthdays? March 26th, March 28th. Oh, my, oh my God. God. Aries. Yeah. So I'm a Leo and Aries is a fire sign. And Please. so many of my best friends and my mom are all Aries. And Aries is a great sign because you're you're loving, but you get shit done. Yeah. Yes, well, we're yeah, a little hard-headed. That's how we would describe each other. Yes, I love yeah. that. <laughs> wow, what a power couple. Two Aries. I know, Two that's Aries, fascinating. Man. Natalie's a Libra, which is good because she's- What, is the Libras, what do Libras do, Natalie? So we're like, um, we like to be balanced and we're actually like peacemakers, diplomats, um we you kind of use that in this like every once in a while come hang like, out. <laughs> yeah. like, so uh, ram heads yeah. yeah well actually aries is my polar opposite yeah technically in the zodiac but i get along with aries so well because honestly like you could put me in any situation and i'll be like this is wonderful let's all just have <laughs> right. a great time yeah, yeah, yeah you know you, everyone <laughs> you know the way our horoscopes work aries work really well together uh they, they, yeah. our horoscope says that aries they they you should get yeah. married to an aries yeah, um, yeah. especially <laughs> if you're like two days apart yeah uh, the, the other thing well year yeah less than two days I'm a little bit younger. The yeah. problem is, and Meg will tell you this because we can't, we can't like, number one, I don't like bullshit. I uh, also don't like, I have a hard time keeping my mouth shut, which some I don't like the latter, but it would be this vicious cycle. I would speak out on something and then people would come back to me because I'm the only person talking about it. So people would come back. I'd say something, yeah. people would come back. And at this point I'm like, right. Fuck man. Like I, like I, I there's gotta be another white guy in here who's willing to say that there's racism somewhere. Yeah. Like, I mean, when you put your arm around, um, it was Malcolm. Malcolm, that, yeah. That moment, I, I just for me, as some like watching that happen, I still get the chills thinking about it. And I was just like, finally, like, finally, somebody standing up, finally, somebody on the team, especially, my God, in the NFL, like to take that stand, just, I feel like it sent, it sent the message, like, it just sent it to the next level. And it was yeah. like, okay, like we're not doing this anymore, you know? Yeah. Like, so for you to just have the the bravery to just be that person, like it just, it sent it, it sent it to another level. And like Nicole and I, we actually, we've, we've talked about you before on the podcast, just because it's like, there's so few people who are just like, you know what? Yes, the NFL is great. Yes, football is great. But like, we all know in the grand scheme of things, is it doesn't really matter. And like, it just that's what we were wondering like what it, like what inspired you you were just like i don't want to do this like this well, is well i, I would have liked i would have liked to have been that i mean i like to think i would have been like that my second third fourth year i'm i'm pretty much me um but it was just kind of that time you know malcolm was out there doing that on an island and yeah we had been talking actually the first conversation i ever had with malcolm was in 2016 in the summer where when Colin Kaepernick was demonstrating, um, we had a big group text, the guys that, you know, were kind of like-minded and how guys were going to, you know, take the ball and run with it. Right. Malcolm had been doing a lot of work for a long time. So I've always yeah. respected Malcolm's off the field work. And I continue to respect Malcolm's off the field work. He's really, you know, you can say what you want about Mal, you know, Mal gets things done. And, um, yeah. and so we never had a conversation like a, like a, like we weren't like tight before that, which was really interesting to me. Like, I just, res here's the thing. I, what's wrong is wrong. And what's, what's right is right. And so yeah. um, I felt pressure because of Charlottesville, not pressured, yeah. but I just felt like it was the right thing to do with everything that happened a couple of days earlier. I can remember sitting in my, my truck on the way home from um, practice the day uh, everything happened in August here. And um, Heather Heyer and all that stuff, and you know all those um, yeah. Tiki yeah. Torch, yeah. Uh, yeah. douchebags. Yeah. yeah, I had another. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll say it. Another word. Yeah, 
<laughs> all those t- all those guys playing militia and playing tiki t- playing with tiki torches you know like descended on charlottesville and that yeah. that was that felt personal but like it wasn't about like me or anybody that lives in charlottesville because if you are a minority in this country that threat is very real every day like that that's a real thing that exists every day and because i thought about it for a couple days and it was right in my face doesn't mean that like it was about me it yeah. was just one of those things that like, i'm from charlottesville this just happened. I just sat in my truck the other night for 20 minutes. I was the maddest I've been in a long time listening to Trump. Yeah. Both sides of the thing and just kind of miss because yeah. everybody in our country was waiting for somebody to make a play and do something positive. And who yeah. could do that? Somebody who's supposed to be a leader. But obviously he was never a leader. Right. right. Um, and he was much worse. Uh, I never, I was never comfortable with I take it as a compliment being called an ally or an activist. I was never comfortable with the word activist because I don't think of myself that highly in the space. What I think of myself as somebody who just tries to tell the truth. Yeah. And um, there are real activists out there that Malcolm would tell you, like we work together with those people who are grassroots people, yeah. whether it's, you know, bail reform or, you know, you know, other areas in criminal justice reform right. or, you know, um, voter rights those there's people that dedicate their whole lives that we're the mouthpiece people. Yeah. And so not, don't for a second, I hope nobody ever thinks that I presume I know more than the experts or that I am on some high ground morally. It's just something had to be said from somebody that looked like me. And that was it. I mean, but I've also talked about this stuff for a long time because, you know, when we were in St. Louis and, and Mike Brown was killed, yeah. that was right there. And oh, so yeah, like, yeah. I can remember in Twitter, in the dawn of Twitter, like when you could say what the fuck you wanted. Yeah. Trayvon Martin happened. And I can remember we were tweeting about that. Like, but it wasn't a thing that NFL people were talking about or that fans were evaluating NFL people talking about. So like- Kaepernick changed all that, really. Cap Cap allowed guys who had interest in the space to have that that visibility. Yeah. And while there's guys like Malcolm who- have been putting in the sweat equity for almost a decade, probably um, at this point. Cap gave the platform to like, okay, we're looking at the anthem now. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I wouldn't have demonstrated with Malk had I not known that he follows it up with action. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I also wish that people would think it wasn't a big deal because I, I would love to get to a place where that's not a big fucking deal. I just yeah. felt kind of almost ashamed that me putting my arm on Malcolm was such a big deal. And I felt kind of uncomfortable with the praise. And I still do. But yeah. it's, but you know, it's something that, <clears throat> and this is how I like look at things and how I look at how things have, you know, transpired over the last four or five, six years. It's something that like, when you look back at moments and everything that this country has gone through uh, recently, like, whether or not you want it, the praise for it, it and the simplicity of it is why it was so powerful, you know? And it's not like, it's just kind of, that's going to be one of those images when you look back in history that you're like, I remember when that happened and just because of the symbolism behind it, right? Like, and it's I not- remember too, I remember too, because it was nerve wracking because I was sitting there and I was like, holy shit, am I really about to do this? I was like, I just know the minute I put my hand on his shoulder, nobody it, it was dead quiet right yeah. it was just the anthem and it was a quiet anthem but i just remember thinking like oh god and i know everybody saw it and nobody was saying anything because it's quiet and i'm like how many people are looking at me and i kind of forgot about it because it was a preseason game i go back in my locker and my phone is just like blowing up and i'm like okay you know when you do something you're like i want to do the right thing but i don't want it to be too popular yes <laughs> yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> that's so hard I mean I I feel the same way I mean it when you said that I can't keep my mouth shut that's me right like I've always been a loud mouth my whole life and I just feel like you got to do what's right and like if people need you to use your voice then use your voice help people yeah. you know yeah. why do you want why do you not want to have everybody feel good so so in in a moment like that the fact that you're right like it shouldn't have been a big deal it should have been like I'm standing in solidarity with somebody who I not only respect, but I, I see what he goes through and I want other people to realize that 
I hear you and see you and I'm listening to you. And the fact that it may, it was this big thing. I get it. Like I get so frustrated too, where it's like, and it's really interesting too, because, because it's so uh, social media really fast, but like you have my parents and I'm very, very blessed. I mean, I'm from near the Poconos, grew up in Summit Hill, PA. There's no um, traffic lights. I, you know, went to Catholic school my whole life, but my whole family is very liberal and I'm very blessed with that. But like my mom is like, all these people she's been friends with for 50 years, she hates them now because of Facebook. She's like, they're yeah. awful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, like, in one sense, it's good that you actually can see how people feel, but it's like, why does it have to be a thing? Like, why can't you just be better? You know? Right. So, well, there's a lot of people that there's fear. There's people that peddle fear and like, there's, I'm not overly um, partisan politically. I am definitely a liberal, but I, I don't, I'm not obsessed with politics. Like right. I think politics are a dirty game and I don't trust yes. politics. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. Okay. That was great. <laughs> People just really quick, you got to listen to Chris and Malcolm's podcast. Thank you. He had Malcolm on, but you yeah. guys talked about that a lot. Just yeah. About, like the political side of activism and how a lot of times politics makes it harder. Well, it's also like, just because you believe, just I just think we try to over align everything. Like yeah. you have to think this, you have to think this. If you think this, then you also must think this. And that, like, there's no nuance and like, and I, I just think there's also a lot of fear peddling um, on one side of the fence where- you know, if we do this very common sense reform in the criminal justice space, there will be criminals in your house. Right. Like, yes. when all the data shows in a lot of these reforms that these very simple things that will save our country money and will get families back on their feet and, and help communities are no brainers and they actually lower crime. Yep. You know, like, I don't want to get into like the specifics, but yeah. I'm just saying that there's a lot of just extreme fear peddling that that stops people from there's a lot of people out there that don't think they're racist yes well because they don't even they don't even understand what it is that's yeah. why <laughs> well they yeah. don't understand what the problem is yeah and so yeah. how to your point natalie how do you if you don't understand what the problem is or you're not realistic about the problem then you might sit there and think i'm not racist i'm getting on facebook and i'm posting this thing and i'm not a racist yeah right. but everybody else is like dude like you're doing the racism thing. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing yeah. the thing. So it, it's just, and social media is the worst place to have these conversations. It's very true. Very the true. worst place. So that's the, that's the, the shittiest thing about last year. This was the biggest crossroads to date in our country. When it comes to like in the last 20 years, making a change, we had yeah. a great opportunity. And I think people seize it and hopefully we keep, keep, keep going, keep going with it, but we had to do it all online. That sucks. Yeah. Sucks. Yeah. Sucks. Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes. My Do song. what now? Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes. You know What's that, that song? Yeah, Blue the Notes. Blue Notes. Yeah, the Harold Melvin in the Blue the Blue Notes. The world won't get much better. That's, That's so true. That's the song. I That's just know the, the Meek Mill song, Blue Notes. Oh, okay. oh no, you got to listen to Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes. Yeah. Okay, cool, song. cool. It's old they're, Philly, they're a Philly. Um, they're a Motown band. Yeah, that must like, be why he oh, called it Blue Notes, or maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Oh yeah, um, probably. So let's Wait, talk about those? really quick because I know before we get, have kept you so long. I know, <laughs> but we're good. The kids are good. The kids are with grandma. Good. So. Okay. Good. All <laughs> right. She's having fun. I don't care. Okay. Yay! So when you started, and Meg, obviously this is such as as you. Did you always know that this was going to be a part of it? Were you ever like when you saw people attacking him on the socials? Were you ever like, Ugh, or were you just like, yeah, let's go? Because I mean, my goal is to be like be like, oh my God, it's so hot that you like are, you know, are helping people who need it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always been, and I don't want to say proud because like he's saying, it's just completely natural for him to speak up and speak out. And he's, um, I just always been a part of him. So I didn't, I didn't think any, I didn't think much of it other than, um, you're doing a great job, you know, that, yeah, you know, yeah. um, I I'm behind you. And I think that Chris has always, you know, from the beginning of Twitter, you know, enjoys a little back and forth. So yeah. 
Um, I was never worried about him. Um, He's like Natalie. He can always handle himself. They're good at Twitter. I'm terrible at Twitter. I'm always like, well, your mom's ugly. Like, I'm just not. (laughs) Hey, but you gotta have that in in the arsenal. I do. Like Natalie, Chris, like Tori Smith's another one. Like, they're just swat. Like, they're (laughs) smooth on Twitter. It's so calm. But I mean, they'll they'll get you. I I hate Twitter. I can't wait to get off. I I say that all the time. I'm like, I can't wait to get rid of all my social media and just raise alpacas. But then I'm like, I see like alpacas. something. Alpacas. Wait, alpaca. Wait. We're going to start our alpaca farm. You are? Stop. Manage the alpaca farm and just live a, a, a I'm not on life. Twitter, which doesn't yeah. mean much. I wouldn't no, have, you know. It's 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 good that you're not. But like at the same time, like I, like I get into it and then like my thumbs like can't stop themselves because then I'm just trying to like outdo these people. And because I'm like, you're all just dumb. You're like, you know just, I mean? like I- <laughs> it, the whole thing trains you to be confrontational. Everything yeah. is confrontation, miscommunication and right. like. And That's and right. think about the act of arguing with people in a room full of people. Why can't you have that argument one on one? Right. And I've done it so many times, and like I'm ashamed of myself in a lot of junctures think- over the last like eight ten years of being like, you look like an idiot. Yeah, like, I know. What are you doing? But and sometimes so- you can't help it, and then you're just like, I you should not say that, and here's why you shouldn't say that. Or even like you, you could sit this one out. Another thing we've done now, and I'm talking yeah. about even people that I agree with, like on on issues. We've made it so every fucking person has to weigh in on every issue. And if you don't, <laughs> if you don't weigh in on this issue, I'm looking at you. And like, maybe that person's not an expert and is afraid yeah. to speak in front of potentially millions of people. Cause right. at any point you can get retweeted yeah. or you know, taken out of context. And so, you know, even for a verified account, that sucks. Yeah. Yes. That's so true. That's so true. So let's talk about the Chris Long Foundation. Obviously, Water Boys, you're doing this whole new initiative called Water for Her. You you did you set up the how when did the chris long foundation you started that in st louis right yeah we started it way back in the day um it was like six years into my career and um we had always done a lot of work off the field like we've always supported boys and girls club and yeah we did a lot of one-off both of you wanted to do right Yeah. yeah 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 but i think it really the idea behind it really came to life after you hiked Kilimanjaro for the first time and met you know, yeah, yeah Doug and John well the, the thing was we were doing a lot of stuff under the radar and honestly I always felt like weird about being charity guy I still feel weird about being charity guy another thing that I'm like I hate the fact that a lot of people think of me as charity guy first and not a good football player um <laughs> which, which drives me a little nuts especially because like when you're when you're on a bad team for a long time nobody pays attention you get there you're like a role player and then you're like charity guy. It just kind of fucking sucks. And they're like, hey, great career, charity guy. Here's so even like Walter Payton Man of the Year, as much as it was awesome, I'm just kind of like, okay, I'm charity guy now. Um we 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 used to do a lot of stuff under the radar because I never wanted to be like, you know how some people yeah, you're yeah. like, okay, I know why you're doing that. You're doing that for the cloud. Yeah. We're like the opposite of those people. And I can say that pretty yeah. honestly. Like, um, but what what I realized and what we realized six years in was like we're not taking advantage of a great asset and that's fans and we're not the 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 best vehicle to grow your cause is the people in your jersey and that support yeah. you and all these people that i'm so appreciative of like we're not engaging them so right. let's start a foundation we we had to talk about it and when i got back from tanzania and i said like what made you want to do that in the first place just yeah because- Michael Majaro, yeah, she was giving me too much shit. I said I had to leave town for three weeks. Or two and were you nervous for him to go? You had to tell me he was going to do Everest one day. I was shut that one I, down. No, you didn't. Time. You yeah. didn't shut oh, that one down. Please. No, you didn't. You told me. Well, did you tell? Remember most when? Dangerous thing you can do. When, yeah. Well, I'll just play football for eleven years. <laughs> do you remember? Do you remember? Um, Aries. Aries. When we were t- yeah. having a kid for the for the first time, and you were having, having a kid. kid. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you have to promise me, though, that you'll let me climb Everest. And you said, yes, I don't think you meant that. No, I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, back in the day, I used to want to climb, like, all the mountains. And then we had kids, and then I think about, like, dying. You know, right. like, and being, like, a huge idiot where your kids are like, oh, my dad died climbing Everest. <laughs> right, and it's like, did he have to do that? Did no, he? Right. <laughs> right, you know, and I tend to like to do, you know, outside the box stuff. And right. so... Jeff Fisher came to St. Louis and he had done a wounded warriors climb on Kilimanjaro. And, uh, I said, man, that looks cool. He had me in his office first meeting and he's showing me pictures, probably showing me that he's cool. And right. I was like, Oh, I'm also cool. I was like, 
I'd like to climb that mountain. He's like, oh, it's fun. Like one day you should. And he had just paid me a bunch of money. Yeah. And right. I was like, I think I'm gonna do that this off season. He was like, I was like, I'm gonna spit his coffee out. But I took a teammate, um, James Hall, who's kind of like my big brother. And uh, begrudgingly, he went with me and we climbed a 20,000 foot mountain and we loved it. Did and, you have to train? Um, I, yeah, did you have to train? Right off the you field, you're trained. Yeah, that's right. true. Oh, true. Well, no, but it's- <laughs> I'm like the think... Stairmaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. I mean, I would like to do it one day. I know I'd have to do a little bit of train. Like you're in great shape. But I think nobody knows till you get up there what the altitude, the altitude. is going to do. Yeah. To, you know, so right. you can be the most in shaped person and still we had a guy not make it. We had a right. guy, ultra marathon runner, forty something years old, um, special forces, so like elite badass guy. Yeah. We get up to seventeen and a half thousand feet. And he hits the deck. It's like two in the morning because you you summit at night. And I'll just remember headlamp and looking down his headlamp and he's spitting blood. And he had to turn back. And so we do Conquer and Killy, fast forward for for water boys, where we bring right. wounded veterans and uh, or just veterans and um and former athletes. Uh Connor Barwin went. Yeah. Uh Bo. Bo Jason. went, yeah. Jason Kelsey went, Haloti went, which oh. was a miracle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that he got to the top I mean, a 40 pound man i mean he's an amazing guy him and Bo, to be that big and climb a twenty thousand foot mountain i'm not even bullshitting you they should be in the guinness book of world records yeah <laughs> well, it's when so i tell funny. you those dudes the porters carried haloti nada down on a gurney like he was the emperor like did I they have really burnt him. yeah because he barely made it to the top yeah oh my god me and the me and the the me and our guide whose name is orca okay is this British dude who's like just <laughs> why? <laughs> well, and they go up and down, up and down, right? I mean, that's yeah, it, yeah. that's what's amazing too. These the guides, the do, porters right? go up the and down. Porters are just that's but the lead here is that the guide is has a British accent. His name is Orca. How cool gonna... are you? Yeah, and Wait. you climb mountains for a living. Anyway, shout out to Orca. Yeah. We were pushing Haloti up the hill, and then they had to load him in a cart on the way down. Long story short, the thing sucks. Uh but it's the coolest like team building exercise. And I can't wait for you. One day to go. women's group. Gonna... Yes. You yeah. know what? I've never really done anything outdoorsy, but <laughs> I'll, you in. I'll, okay. I'm in. I'm okay. totally in. And I it's can't wait to start. see the, I can't yeah. wait to see the photos. Like I'm just gonna love the no, come on, you the have to come. But wait, the pictures I, are worth it. Yeah. I like I'm I've skydived and I bungee jumped and I've did zip lining. You're like I've done, Whoa, I haven't done those yet. You're kinda <laughs> Got but I don't I don't know I never I'm actually am in in May hiking the wave in Arizona oh uh, see you'll yeah. be fine um but that's not it's moderate and like it just was a really weird thing or total side note but like one of my best friends entered the lottery in October and she won the lottery because they only allow like 8,000 visitors a year and so I was like well I guess I have to go but it's like moderate you're not really like hiking that it's sounds not, actually really dope uh, kilimanjaro is not a technical climb it's the highest um freestanding mountain in the world nineteen thousand three hundred forty-one feet it's also the uh highest walkable mountain in the world so okay. if you have to turn back it's because you can't handle weak intense it's cold that's the thing is like you think africa you think hot okay it's right. hot at eight thousand feet where you put right. in but some at night it's um you can't feel your toes um it's snowing maybe um and you on the way down when the sun comes up you get sunburn uh from oh, no. and it's 30 degrees and you're getting sunburned because you're so high up so it's just How? a lot of challenges it had nothing to do with its altitude or it's yeah. just all the bullshit how long does it take to get up uh five and a half days and it's like another one and a half down to and were you like was Waylon born the first time you did it like Meg were you freaking out uh was mm. Waylon born no. no not the first time okay no honestly I wasn't freaking out I thought he'd be fine it's just more you can't communicate really um, oh right, right right there's sat phones no wi-fi certain <laughs> yeah so I, 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 up, I you I, could call like it'd be like real choppy so I would be yeah. like okay I know he's okay he's talking yeah. like so. in the movie Everest when they call and they're like yeah. avalanche <laughs> yeah like <laughs> Like it's kind of how the sat phone sounds, but I'm just like, how's the, how are the kids? Like, mm -hmm. uh, honestly, it's funny with the sat phones um, because that's one of the hardest things is leaving your family for a week and saying, oh, I, at any point, something could be wrong. 
Mm-hmm. You know, like your dad instinct and like, yeah. I couldn't even imagine you leaving the kids for a week, but right. Like just <laughs> not being able to, I don't have a cell phone. So if something's wrong, Meg can call me, even yeah. if I can't do anything about it, right. I just want to know. Yeah. And yeah. that kind of sucks. Right. That sucks. I miss my kids so bad when I like, yeah, that's the thing that sucks. Like I used to want to travel there. the getting world. There's a pain too. Yeah. It's a long, you know, yeah. 30 20, hours, 30 hours to get there. And then, wow. So obviously water boys. So now we're doing, a, it's called water for her. And it it's kind of around women's history yeah. month, right. Is when we kicked it off, which is what we're in now. And the goal is to get a hundred thousand women to get a hundred thousand women and girls fresh, clean water in East Africa. Yes. Yep. That's it's the so- plan to mobilize a hundred thousand women in the U S to then empower 100,000 East African women through. And so how do we, so how do we, what do we do? How do we call to action? People listening, yes. what's the call to action? Yes, okay. The call so, to action. I always forget the call to action. Yes. That's so, what the <laughs> Just most Google important thing right yeah. now is to build this team of 100,000 women. So okay. um, go to waterforher.org, water number four her.org and provide your email address. And that helps join our, join the mission right away. Okay. Um, if you're on the site and you're, you know, so willing to give $25, that provides clean water for one woman or girl. Wow. So the goal is for basically a hundred thousand women to essentially give $25 and, or by providing your email, you might start a team and, you know, your team fundraises and, you know, you build a larger amount of money that, that goes to that. So, um, you know, we last week, um, announced like an unbelievable group of women who have joined water for her, um, as ambassadors, you know, Julie Ertz, yeah. um, don't wait. Really... I mean, and that's been frustrating. Cause we're like, we don't want the Ertz's to leave. Oh, I, like, yeah. talked to Lee- I just talked to Lisa this morning. We were talking about the geo thing. Yeah. Oh, Lisa's Lisa's awesome. <laughs> Lisa's amazing. really yeah. great. Yeah. yeah I, I, I ran into Lisa in Tanzania. <laughs> like at a lodge, like <laughs> randomly. Yeah. Wait, you just that. happened yeah, to be there. She was out there doing some like mission work or something. And we just ran into each other and it was just like, what? Random. But it's great. Like Julie's amazing. And like, you know, some of my friends in sports media, like Mina Kimes and Krista Thompson, like it's these girls have been crushing it with, with, uh, yeah. Yeah. They, you know, they've created essentially a team and, you know, they're trying to promote their fans and followers to donate to their team and get involved and, you know, similar sense, any, any one person can start a team. And then you try to rally your friends, rally your network, your group to kind of, you know, spread it and, and help build this, this team of 100,000 women. And if you're not raising enough money, coach Meg will get on zoom and yell at you and your team. Oh my God. You might make us run laps. (laughs) Oh my God. I'm getting the shakes. Yeah. (laughs) That's amazing. in in the sense of that, this has been you know, it started as the water boys and now it's grown into this massive, massive organization. And I think it's also really important for people to realize that like, yeah, we're talking about, you know, issues that are going on in our country, but there's, we're, it, it, we're a global entity. And when you think that there are people who exist, who do not have clean water and you have the ability to just to give $25 to lit, I mean, clean water. Right. And I just think that, it's so important to remember that like, yes, we could, we could talk about issues here, but think about the world, think about, you know, helping a legacy and helping people just exist, exist. In- it's like a basic, it's like a yes. human right. You would think, right. But like, it, it's not. it should, it, sh- it should, it should be. And, you know, the reason we got into it is I think it's the biggest um, driver for um, a community yeah. improving on every level. And then, there are people dying because of waterborne illness, like at a very high rate, um, especially where we work. And yep. one of the biggest heartstring pullers for me is like the kids, man, like we, it's so cliche, but we'll go to a school and kids will run down a hill, like a hundred yards and um, a primary school. I remember taking these veterans who have seen some crazy shit. Yeah. And kids are running down and drinking out of a Creek that runs through an urban area, has a gasoline film on it. And these are elementary school kids is trash in the creek not even a second thought this is what i drink at school it's hard enough to learn it's hard enough to be successful and to grow up um we all know that from like our privileged privileged uh upbringings on different levels but like 
imagine just like being sick perpetually or in a, in a fog because you're drinking like and and also it's a women's issue that's right. why we yeah, that's, right. why that's why we ended really up really focusing right now yeah. on the water fur because women and girls bear total responsibility for collecting water so yeah. girls aren't even in school you know and um yeah. this this water for her the movement is to hope that you know, we give these women and girls back the opportunity to be in school, to lead their community, to earn a living for their family. Yeah. yeah. I think that people, that's what people really need to realize is that it's not as simple as like, oh, they need clean water. It's they're not in school because their responsibility is to get water. So if you help, like it's layers, it's levels and, right. and people there's need levels. To, yeah. People, I like that. There's levels to this shit. And yes, also, yeah. and also, I mean, you talk about women being like mvps in communities and that's not even like patronizing or anything like there's data that yeah that backs yeah. that up that like yeah. if you're giving women opportunities guess who's gonna thrive everybody yeah. yeah and so um you know you're giving women peace of mind like i'm not chancing it um giving my kids water that I'm not sure is going to kill them, which is a reality. We think about how much we love our kids. And like, literally, Meg, I make fun of her because you're like, is Wayland's thermostat at 71? <laughs> like, he's going to go, like, there. he's going to be like, like sneak in and put some socks He's going to be like fucking Jack from Titanic. <laughs> like, if he comes in there and, and it's 70 so degrees. True. But but you talk about, you talk about in like these, <laughs> you talk about in these. uh Rose, these, don't leave me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> No, mama. Yeah. I feel like I'm on a lifeboat. I'll never let go. In the Arctic. I'll never let you go. Yeah, he, he, that's what he's like when you go there. Oh. That's more like what Luke's like, the younger one. Um, yeah. But Waylon can't, he doesn't give a shit about it. He's like, I'm not waking up. Um, yeah. So women have to, I just cannot imagine parents in general, you know, like, hey, Waylon, have a sip of water. And I don't know if it's going to give you... Um, you know, giardia and diarrhea. And that's bad enough here. But when you can't treat those things there, that kills kids. Diarrhea yeah. kills kids. So yeah, they're dehydrated. Well, it's like they just it's go dehydration. dehydration. Yeah. It's dehydration. Yeah. And so, and so what we're, this is the most excitement I've had, honestly, about like we're doing a thing that we should have been doing a couple of years ago. We just, right. I think a lot of times people are like, We'll do that right now. Do that right now. Like we're we're grassroots. We grew from the bottom up, and so this has been the first thing that we've wanted to do. And to be honest, I'm energized because I've said this to Meg. The women we've had involved have done five times more than the average dude. <laughs> you heard Shocking. it here. Like, right. <laughs> no surprise here on the lipstick league. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Seriously, first week I was like, "Holy shit! Can I just like get rid of all the guys?" I'm just right. joking. <laughs> I don't want anybody to get offended if there's dudes. <laughs> no. We get offended easily. But you know, women, women, like I feel like we're just so instinctual, right? When it comes to so many things in life. And that's, you know, I'm not trying to get all like deep and philosophical, but like, you know, mother nature and mother earth and like all that stuff. And then it's like, you know, you tell a group of women, like there are children who are thirsty and we're like, oh my God, like they cannot yeah. be thirsty anymore. Like it's <laughs> yeah. just this like, it's just and there's no dwelling on it it's like fix it yeah no, it's, so it's like, like we're gonna figure out how to fix it and, and we have to come fix together it right now because yeah. there's yeah like there's children in africa who are dying because they don't have water and like they need to have water right now they needed to have it mm -hmm. yesterday and i yeah. think it's just like this female intuition thing where it's just like you never want anybody it's like an instinctual maternal thing right where yes. you're just like you never want anybody to like be suffering and especially when it comes to something so basic like like having drinking water like it's yeah, right it seems unfathomable but that's just how so many people in the world live and it's it's unbelievable that in like 2021 you know like and again i you know you know about this kind of stuff but until like you guys bring it to the forefront of people's minds it's something that like people in their daily lives don't think about it's outside the box right. Yeah. Right. Just right. What, what, what we've been so proud about is like for us in, in america it's such a foreign concept unless you turn on your tv and you see that there's like a flint or right. you yeah. know, there's oh water God. shortage in california or there's yeah. like issues with how you're farming there and their scarcity um we started um hometown h2o as well which is domestic because so many people oh, ask okay. what about america and yep. yeah people have trouble giving when they you know when it's yes. not which on is their homes which is which we is get, wild to me well, well yeah we get you it. get to a certain
certain extent, but it's why are you asking the question? What, right. like, you know, what I mean, like, if you're asking the question to be a dick, like, I know, yeah. but if you're like, if you have a serious concern for like, what are we doing here? Like, you're making a good point. Water is not perfect in America either. Yeah. It's just more subtle, the issues we're dealing with. Yeah. Like, um, so I'm excited about what we're doing there. We're really excited about domestic uh, work as well. It's awesome. Thank it's, yeah. Did you ever see that lady? She went viral over the <clears throat> summer. She like stripped her clothes down. It was on Santa Monica Boulevard and was just screaming because she was just like losing her mind. That's how I feel sometimes. I'm like, how do I do it all? How do I help? <laughs> like, that's how I feel. I'm like, I just like want to stop racism and give people water. It's like, it's sometimes it's so overwhelming. So you just got to like, do yeah. your little part. That's, I mean, like literally, <laughs> yeah. and that's why, that's why I hate when people beat each other up about, you should do this. Hey, this person's doing a good thing. You should do this differently. Or like, why is this person not doing that? You forgot about this thing. Like, I think we could all as a society be better about building each other's up when we're giving effort. Absolutely. And because this is tricky, whether you're talking about, especially for people who look like us talking about racism or like, like we could yeah. say the wrong thing. Like, I don't yeah. You know, like I, I could be have my heart in the right place. And or if you're talking about clean water, like we've made mistakes, we've we've failed, we've right. we've we've had stupid concepts. Like the first concept we had with Water Boys was dumb as hell. And I came up with it. And I thought all like I was like, this is the model. We're going to do it this way. And it sucked. And dudes like I cold called dudes and they were just like, what? <laughs> so I think there's trial and error with all this. And oh, yeah. you got to be patient because. All these problems are going to be solved after we're gone. Yeah. That's what like working faithfully is like, right. We're not working so that we have a better world right now. Like that'd be great. Yeah. But in all these areas, we're just, we, we have faith that like the next generation is going to take the torch and finish this thing. Yeah, yeah for sure. For, for sure. sure. Well, thank you so much guys. I know so, so much time. I mean, we had so much fun hanging out with you guys. Oh, good, man. Yeah, we, we thanks enjoyed for it. having us. We don't this see a lot of people. Awesome. So. Yeah. No. Well, we appreciate you spending time with us. Next time, we'll give you the blue sweater memo. Yeah. <laughs> right. We can all match. Make sure we get V next. <laughs> yes. Meg, you're not on any of the socials for people to find you. You're just I'm like, on Instagram, but I'm not public. public. All right. Well, that's fine. Good for you. Start a separate. Start a separate public one. No. We've been talking about yeah. making her an influence. For the alpacas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like making alpaca. The alpacas. Like the, the long packas. Well, it was when Chris posted that stupid basketball reel the last couple of weeks. I love that. About that it. I got a badass. Like, like so many in Karen, all of a sudden. Uh, Jabbar here. So many yeah. requests. I'm like, Chris, you got to stop, man. Yeah. Did you get a lot um, of requests? Oh, yeah. From dudes? Yeah. Oh, man. Dude, yeah. Well, be dudes. careful. People love to slide into those DMs. That's right. No, especially That's if she's right. a, an athlete. Karen <laughs> Abdul Jabbar, hilarious. <laughs> um, all right. So obviously the green light pod, it's incredible. I mean, it's so fancy. It's a whole, you know, it's a whole it's Very our fancy. it's what we strive to be. Yeah, stop a it. Studio. You have the and shout out yeah, to fancy but, studio. We're so we're so dry and low energy. You guys are awesome. It's like a breath of fresh air. <laughs> oh, and, thank you. So check us out on green light. Um and, and all yeah. your socials socials uh joel 91 on twitter and then la flama blanca 95 on uh instagram yeah. on the gram well um, yes thank you long thank you guys best. yes thank you longs um and we'll yeah, be, and we can't wait to come to the alpaca farm will be so come cool. on down hey i know i mean Although every time matt comes to visit you something happens with his car a rat eats it and then the windshield broke oh. <laughs> He's, he's down in the sticks, man. Yeah. They, my boys were wondering when Uncle Matt was coming, but Uncle Matt on the tow truck. Yeah. That's like what they okay, remember. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, we had brunch. He goes, well, guess what happened to my car now? I go, didn't you just have an issue with huh. the rat eating the car? And he's like, I, I wasn't going to call Westchester again because I think <laughs> mad at me. So I had to get the windshield. It's true fixed. though. They probably would have been like, you're there again. I can't. Yeah. Once again, I, I can't help this you. fucking guy. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly you're driving a little erratic. I feel yeah. like. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. Runs in the family. Yeah. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful weekend and um, we'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah. Have a good right, day. All right, guys. See y'all. All right. Bye. Thank you. Okay.